Anja, normally we think of science and art as sort of the, the two uh, different, radically different approaches in the world, but um, people now, and you uh, in particular, have been using rigorous science to study the production of art. So wh what are the capabilities of science, from physics to psychology, neuroscience, to focus on what, how art works? So we can look at just the nature of art itself. Uh, for example, if you have a painting, what are its physical properties? Uh, and there have been techniques that have been developed uh, where one applies various kinds of statistics just to images. Mm. Uh, and you may have heard, or other people may have heard of, uh, the notion that an image can have fractal properties, something that's quantifiable. Uh, there are Fractal properties meaning that uh, each element is the same structure getting smaller and smaller. Smaller. So there's a notion of self-similarity. You look uh -huh. at a small thing, you look at a large thing, uh -huh. they're very similar to each other in terms of their structure. And this can be mathematically quantified. Uh, you can, and that could be related to a sense of beauty or form well, so or that's, symmetry? That's a kind of question yeah, that right. people ask, right? right? Uh, it, it, in our hands, uh, it appears that these kinds of statistics that are just embedded in the object uh, are better at classifying different kinds of artworks, but they're not so clear whether they systematically relate to people's response to artworks. Uh, it looks like there might be clusters of people, there are individual differences. Certain people respond to certain kinds of statistics and others to different ones. Um, then you can look at uh, what's happening in the brain. So that's a kind of outer psychophysics. Right. Uh, and you can look at an inner psychophysics, uh, which is, wh what is the, how is the brain responding uh, to, to artworks? Uh, and uh, one example of a kind of experiment uh, is we all often have different responses to different kinds of artworks, right? You might uh, really enjoy Hopper and I might really enjoy Rembrandt, and someone else might really enjoy Rothko, right? These are just differences in how, what we bring to when we're looking at something. Interestingly, it turns out that if we are deeply moved, if we really enjoy an artwork, our neural responses are more similar than different, even though that might have happened with the Rothko for you and with the Hopper for me, once you're in that state, uh, that our brains are responding in a common way, uh, in, a, in a similar fashion. Uh, and so that's one way we can try to deal with variability, uh, the, the, the general notion being the experience. When you, once you have the experience, we're going to be more similar to each other, uh -huh. but the trigger for the experience might be, be different. Radically different. Right. And could that be cross-modality? Could it be, you know, I'm listening to a Mahler symphony and you're looking at a Rembrandt painting and you can see similar parts of our brains doing similar things, which were both in that enjoyment, appreciation. Right, so there, well, I don't know that that experiment has been done, but the speculation would be that uh, in, if you're listening to the symphony, uh, the auditory cortex sure. would be certainly engaged. So at the modality level, there are going to be profound di di differences. Difference, then in the reward systems, they will be more similar than mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. right? So that, that the kind of pleasure we'd get. Mm -hmm. And then there's another piece that, uh, that is important uh, to realize is um, there is a whole meaning and semantics overlay on all of this, right? So you have the sensation, you have the reward and emotional response, but there's a meaning layer uh, which has to do with uh, what our education is, what our training is, what our background is. If you grew up listening to Mahler as a child, that's going to be very different than someone like me who never listened to Mahler growing up. Mm -hmm. And so our semantic systems, our, our systems of meaning within the brain, uh, have, have an overlay of influencing these kinds of pleasures. Right, and so that makes sense. So you have the basic modality, right. you have a meaning layer, and, but, but, but you still have the same same reward. Of, same reward. Right. Now, is that reward system the same kind of reward system? Because now we're dealing with this high level of intellectual yeah. creativity and grandeur and transcendence and feeling one with the universe or whatever we feel when we, when we experience great art. Uh, but is that the same system that uh, deals with food satiation, sexuality, you know, the basic yeah. bodily uh, pleasures that we have? 
at its core, at a minimum, it uh, capitalizes on the same systems, right? That the, you know, there aren't, uh, there isn't a separate kind of uh, higher cognitive higher, reward. Well, there might be a higher cognitive reward, but I think those are layered on top, okay. right? So for example, if you, uh, let's take food, right? A fundamental thing that we enjoy, but you know, if you're a chef, it might be very different than if you're, you know, a kid eating right. your hamburger and right. having great joy out yeah, of it, right. right? So I think even the primary rewards, the way they get elevated is by in bringing in different systems, uh, different set of associations. Mm. Now, what constitutes the reward system that you can monitor with high confidence? A couple of things. One is where in the brain. Uh, so there are certain parts of the brain that are known to be uh, to implement these reward systems. Uh, the common areas are a structure called the ventral striatum, and within that, the nucleus accumbens seems to be very important. Where is that located? Uh, it's located kind of in the middle, no. in the deep. It's close to the basal ganglia. It's part of the basal ganglia, mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, right in front of that parts of ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So that would be in the middle, right above the eye. And then the part of the cortex that just rests above the eye, orbifrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So these seem to be the general reward systems. And you know, in people who are studying this, there are questions of is there, what's the immediate response? What's an accumulated response, oh, yeah. right? Okay. You know, you see something, you get an immediate pleasure response. But you know, after a while, you know, does that change? Does it get modulated? Uh, you know, is there... So that's a very interesting question yeah. because one of the um, potential criterion of, of great art is that it doesn't peak and then diminish. It, it, it builds over time, whereas, a, I don't know, some superficial ditty tune, you might like it a couple times, then it gets boring and then it right. gets annoying. Yeah. Uh, whereas a great piece of music, whatever your style is, if it's jazz or classical, uh, that the more you hear it, the more you, you, you want to hear it, the more you enjoy it, and the more you see depth to it, etc. No question, and this is also... Um, something that has not been studied very much. Uh, it's one function of being a very young field that really mm -hmm. basic questions haven't been addressed yet. 